somebody more uh, stringent. <laughs> uh, on my left, I have Joan Schilling, Professor of Psychology at Edgewood College. On my right, uh, Professor Emerita Charlotte Meyer, Professor of English. So let's start out. Uh, Charlotte, uh, where did you grow up? I am a Chicagoan. Okay. I was, anyway. What it's neighborhood? In Chicago, in Austin, and I went to St. Lucie's Grammar School, and then I went to Trinity High School, which is run by the Cincinnati Dominicans. And I think that has a lot to do with how I got here. Hmm, interesting. Uh, Joan, you, where did you grow up? I grew up in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. I went to St. Mary Springs Academy and uh, Marion College uh, in Fond du Lac for my undergraduate work and then came here to Madison. Except for a brief respite in Munich, I have never left. Ah, really? Um, okay, uh, Joan, what was your family like? Was it... Uh, oh my gosh. <laughs> What was my family like? Yeah, it was an extended family, nuclear no, family. No, we, we were um, an Irish family. Okay. And um, sort of a, a kind of a shanty Irish family that was aspiring to lace curtain <laughs> Irish. And, um, um, you know, it was, as I tell my students, it was the, the division of gender labor in my family is that the men drank and the women wept. It was sort of a veil of tears kind of family, and uh, but a you know a, a functional family, and they we were clean and pressed and neatly mended and fed and uh, disciplined and and so on. Okay, uh, Charlotte, what was your family like? All right, my family had four children, um, and my two, two sisters and a brother. And the thing that made my family, I would say, a little unique was that my father was not Catholic. In those days, that was called a mixed marriage between my mother and my father. And he remained, uh, I would say, not religious at all, but very supportive of the, the kids, his kids all going through Catholic schools. So uh, we belonged to St. Lucy's. We were devout Catholics. We went away in the summertime to our summer home, and we went to St. Gilbert's in the summertime. My father drove us to church for years and years, and then the car was outside waiting for us when the church was over. So uh, I guess we went to private schools the whole time. My brother go, go, went to the boys' school and we went to Trinity. Uh, I, guess, uh, I guess we were pretty typically a Catholic urban family with the one anomaly that my dad wasn't a practicing Catholic. Okay, and I'll, I'll toss this uh, one out and so who can answer it first? What did your parents do for a living, either of you? Um, my mom, as they say, never worked outside the home. She uh, took care of the home and the children and my dad, and my dad worked in a factory, went early in the morning, uh, came home yeah, fairly early in the afternoon, and uh, yeah, worked all of his life okay. in a factory huh. until he died. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Wow. My dad, my mom uh, was a homemaker, we used to say, uh, and my dad worked for AT&T. As a boy of 17 out of high school, he got a job working for a jeweler for a couple of weeks, and then AT&T were looking for messenger boys, and he took that job, and he stayed with AT&T for 47 years, and he ended up in middle management. Oh, good heavens. And my mother uh, was delighted when it became necessary, she thought, for her to go to work, because she, the kids were going through college, and so she got a job in a bank. She was so happy. She just loved working. It meant so much to her. Mm -hmm. And so then when we got finished with college, my father suggested she quit so they could travel. Anyway, that was the end of her career. <laughs> but that was, uh, that was my family. Neither one of them went to college, and yet I, I, I'm proud of them because they made a good life for us. Mm -hmm. We all went to school. We left college without any debt. We had a little cottage in the summertime. We, my dad played the cello for the Oak Park River Forest Symphony for 50 years from the time he was a boy, just out of high school. So there's a lot of stability, I would say. Okay. Maybe to a fault. Oh. <laughs> you know, and, and that's true because um, the work ethic was just amazing, in, not only in my family, but in, in all of the families. Like we never bought anything we couldn't pay for, and uh, right. no debts, you know, and uh, it, it was a very, um, very, um, I don't want to say rigid, but stable 
type uh, stable life in terms of you knew exactly what you needed to do and not do. Very important. Right. Yeah, that's right, Joan. You know, I, I used to think of, we, we all did, we thought of my dad as a real tight wad. You know, he wasn't ever going to buy one of those balloons we would drive by on Harlem Avenue. He was never going to stop to buy the guy that sold balloons, mm -hmm. the hot air balloons. And I think now, he probably was such a tight wad because he was a guy without a college degree that was supporting six people, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and getting us all through school. So he was frugal. You know, in terms of your mother, my mother would love to have worked outside the home, you know, and she had until she got married, and then my father told her that he was going to take her away from all of that, and that she'd never have to <laughs> work her to death in the kitchen. <laughs> but that was so typical of that era. We're talking the 50s, the 40s and 50s here. Okay. Um, okay, uh, Charlotte, what were your intellectual interests as a youngster, and uh, whose thought influenced you? Oh, that's a tough question. Wonderful. Let me think that about that. I would say that I was always a reader. I loved to read. Mm -hmm. And the other thing was I loved to be outside. My sisters were going where the boys were in the summertime, for example, and I would kind of like to go out in the rowboat or walk around in the woods. And I think that stayed, I don't know why that was true of me, mm -hmm. and it still is, quite yeah. obviously. Yeah. So, and I, I my, who, who, who influenced my thought? Well, you know, there was one sister at Trinity. She was my, she was an English teacher. She was a long, tall glass of water sister. I can't say her name, her name now, but I remember one day in class, she said, there was an old Persian folk tale about um, someone who had no money left he could spend it on a loaf of bread or a bouquet of violets. Mm. And he bought those violets because we need beauty as much as we need food. And that was such a transformative thing for Isn't me. Here I am, how many years later, still remembering that. Yeah. And, and realizing that, you know, literature was beauty. <laughs> you know, you know. It's so interesting. I, I had a similar type of intellectual awakening, if you want to call it that. My, Parents, my mother didn't go to high school. My dad, I think, did and graduated. He was in World War I, but he loved poetry. And I still have a little shelf in my house with some of his poetry books. And they were very uh, 19th century sentiment, Longfellow and Tennyson. Uh -huh. But he would, he would um, recite poetry. And I remember one time... Um, I was reciting uh, Joyce Kilmer's, I think that I shall never see a poem as lovely as a tree. And uh, poems are made by fools like me, but only God can make a tree. And my father was sitting there, and he said, Joyce Kilmer wasn't a fool. He, he was uh, were, uh, killed in World War I, and my father was very, became very emotional uh, at that particular time. But anyway, uh, that was very important. But another thing that was important, and I loved reading too, and not all great books, you know, um, the, uh, mysteries, the little girls' mysteries. I loved Nancy Drew. Yeah, those types of things. I loved Little Men by Louisa May Alcott. <laughs> this is another thing. I inherited books from my older brothers, so I inherited Little Men, not Little Women. But also my public school. I went to St. Joseph's School, which was the Irish people's school in Fond du Lac, and those sisters, boy, talk about tough love. Um, and we memorize poetry, and I know that is so out, although I remember you, Charlotte, having your <laughs> I mean, students memorize poetry, but, but I still remember, and that was an awakening for me too, a Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, you know, the standards, um, Shakespeare's uh, Merchant of Venice, these are things we read in 8th and ninth grade. And, um, and then, you know, I went to the Catholic high school, which was sort of a melting pot, because I was from a working class neighborhood, but there was only one high school. So I went to school with girls whose families had aspirations for them, which I you know, learn from. But anyway, the sisters were, were terrific uh, in terms of instilling me really with, with a lot of love of literature. I was an English major too as an undergrad. Huh. I was, the next question has to do with books. Uh, Joan, I think you, any other books come to mind? Oh okay. gosh, well they're, uh, you mean from childhood? Well, or? actually when you got to be a teenager and, and, oh, and, and thinking well, um, more serious thoughts. I remember, um, let's see, teenage books, oh, 
<laughs> the, um, um, when I was a teenager, I discovered Edna St. Vincent Millay, who was a, a, a steamy uh, poet from the 1920s, uh -huh. and she was the one who, um, so I discovered her poetry, and I was into sentim sentimental types of poetry. Um, I'm trying to think of some of then when I was a little older as a teenager, about 1960, I discovered uh, J.D. Salinger, and I adored him. Uh, not The Catcher in the Rye. That one just didn't speak to me for some reason. But uh, Franny and Zoe. Fran, Franny and Zoe. That was 1961, I think. So those kinds of things. Um, I'm trying to think. Maybe I can think while well, Charlotte talks uh, about hers. Yeah, so Charlotte, books that influenced you as a teenager and you know, young adult. What, 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 what got you? It. That's, a good, that's a good question. I do remember being quite taken with Saul Bellow. Oh, he yes. A, he Chicago writer. He had a book called Herzog. Yes, I read that and when I was... It was very sexy. You yes, know? it was. It and, was indeed. Oh, my goodness. But there was so many... And there was a lot in that book, too, about... Not, not, not that I think it was a great book, particularly. It was a good book, though. But anyway, uh, what I realized is that Bello was taking revenge on his mm. first wife. Yes, I read that recently. It was, it was I mean, it was apparent to mm -hmm. me that this book was mm -hmm. somehow very autobiographical. Yes. And that he was using his name and his stature to really get back right. at her. Right. And boy, did he ever. He really did. And I thought, gee, there's all kinds of ways to read fiction. I think I like fiction best. I don't, I'm not much, I do read nonfiction quite a bit of it, but fiction, to me, is important. We were talking about this yeah, just last yeah. night because it's somebody's version of the world is what it is. It's not necessarily the world, but it's mm -hmm. somebody's version, somebody's analysis, somebody's interpretation. And you see how people think. That that book was influential for me because I saw the narrator behind yeah. the script, behind the text. Mm -hmm. I saw the narrator. Mm -hmm. it was really interesting. You know, there was a, a class that was now that that was influential for me. When I was a senior in college, um, I took a course in world literature. Now, I was a fervent Catholic, you know, and our educations were sound, but definitely we were not encouraged to think outside the box. Definitely not. I mean, you know, you question only so far, at least in my little corner of the world. And I remember reading the, the text in world literature there was the Bible, and there were other religious books. And I thought, oh, wait a minute here. Wait a minute. You mean the Bible and Christianity and Judaism, which was sort of over there, they're not the only religions. There are other religions with other books. It was just such, I was a senior in college when I discovered this. <laughs> anyway. Oh, funny. Um, okay. Um... Before you became, came to Edgewood, what were you doing? <laughs> oh, brother, that's a good story. Uh, it's a story that Joan and I share. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hold forth. All right. I was, for a variety of reasons, not finished with my dissertation, but my TA had run out. Um, somebody in, who was a graduate student, had been a graduate student with me, gave me a call. He said, I'm the chair of the English department down here at Milton. We need somebody at the last minute. Mm. School had already started, so I started teaching at Milton College in order to sustain myself. And you came on mm -hmm. in the psych department. Right, in, in, in 1976, right? right? The same year? Yes, And right. I was thrilled to death. I had just finished my PhD. I was thrilled to death to get a job, any job. Oh, and they wanted to pay me $11,500 <laughs> a year, and I thought, you want to pay me that much money? Oh, I'd be still my heart. So we were both at Milton for four years. Now, how shall we say this? During the four years we were there, <laughs> it, Milton was going down the tubes. It was, you know, just a really Sears a failed a college. And um, a um, Sears retired mid-management guy yeah. took over the presidency. Right, right. And every faculty person had a page in a three-ring binder, right. and how many, what your enrollment was right, right. on your class. So if you were teaching classics, let's say you were in bad trouble because, yeah. and so your your raises were predicated on how many students, how many warm bodies you were bringing. The college was folding. Yes. And I was saying to Joan, I remember when we would get, somebody in the office would 
give us a, we would find a, a little slip of paper, like a piece of typing paper had been cut many times, and it said, payroll will be delayed this month because the computers are down. And we'd say, what computers are those? <laughs> <laughs> there were no computers yeah. there. We were never paid on time. We were never paid on time. So anyway, I had gone at, during this last year, at 1980-ish, um, I had gone to a conference and met Sister Marie Sarah Deneen, who was teaching at Edgewood, a lovely woman, and uh, she wanted to know if she could ride with me to a, the next conference because we were both from Madison. And she said, you know, there's an opening in the psychology department. I think you should apply. Oh, thank you, Sister Marie Sarah Deneen, wherever you are. We know from... where she is, John. Yes, I know. So anyway, I did, and um, this was 1980, and Sister Alice O'Rourke hired me, and I remember she was what I, then. I I was coming in to interview, and I had, I had left Catholicism years before, and I thought, a Catholic college? And I wanted to make sure I didn't look too flashy. So I remember I, I pulled my hair back in a bun and I wore a long shapeless skirt and a long shapeless dull blouse. And I remember coming in to interview with Sister um, Miriam Yeager. And it was spring, it was April. And she was dressed in her beautiful spring pastel uh, suit lovely makeup, her hair done beautifully, and I had the feeling she was looking at me and like, she's a little frumpy, isn't she? But anyway, and then I went up to see my sister Alice O'Rourke, and it was a hot day in April, and I sat at the table in her office, and it was one of these Formica, you know, conference tables, and I remember my arms were on the table, I folded them, and when it was so hot, that when I lifted up my arms, they went, <laughs> and it was, so anyway, I would have, I would have done anything to come to Edgewood. Well, I had started here part-time uh, in probably 78, because we weren't making any money in Milton, and yeah, I had to pay the rent. But anyway, this was what amuses Joan and me about our, I first interview with Sister Alice O'Rourke. Oh, yes. I'd been teaching there part-time, so she knew, and I was a, what is called an old girl from Trinity High School, which is their high school. And so uh, when I went in to see her, she offered me the job as freshman advisor at something like $12,000 a year. And I just said to her, Sister, I couldn't live on that. And that yes. was the end of that interview. And then she called me back. I don't know what the interim was, a week, couple weeks mm -hmm. or something. Then she offered me a job in the English department for, for more money. 13, 13, something, five something. or something like that. So I took the job. But anyway, then we would meet in the halls, and we, our first week, then, and we'd say, You can Xerox these. Xerox, here. yes. We <laughs> at Milton, we had an old mimeograph and so on. Nobody <laughs> Xerox. So, did you see the library? And we were paid on time. <laughs> yes. It was amazing. We just thought we, we were in heaven. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and you know, it was Sister uh, Jane Mauer, RIP, mm -hmm. dear Sister Jane. She interviewed me. And this is my cute story about Sister Jane. She, she was, I don't know if you knew her. She, you remember her, maybe? Oh, yes, absolutely. She's a little bit brusque in her manner. Very. The kids called her Sarge. Anyway, she said, uh, on the phone, we had we met by the phone, and she said, well, you won't, you won't recognize me because I'm not in the habit. I'll be wearing, and I was going to film in the word, pantsuit. Mm -hmm. And she said, I'll be wearing a pantsuit. <laughs> and there she was in a pantsuit. And things were changing yeah, in the order, in other words. But anyway, she, 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 she used to call the lay people the seculars. And I think as the years went by, it was a little too secular for her. But I, I loved her very much and admired her. She was a, she was a good, good gal. Well, what was Edward like when you got here? Mm, yes. You want to go it's first? so many ways the same. Mm -hmm. So many That's ways true. the same. The spirit of the place is it, very much intact, I think, the, as it was when we got here. But my gosh, the college is just. When I come back, I've been retired over 10 years now, and when I walk onto campus, I cannot believe it. It is such, to me, a beautiful, beautiful campus. Mm -hmm. It's just so beautifully landscaped. The lake is right there, and all these wonderful buildings. Yeah. I remember here, I was here one time when the fire department came. <laughs> I don't know why I remember this. And the fire chief said, 
this is a fine property here. This is a really <laughs> fine property. I felt a surge of pride that no. was <laughs> recognized. But I'll tell you one thing that yeah. sort of irritates me, and I think it's the same, and that is why the neighborhood does not accept the college. I think they are so lucky to have this college here. Yeah. They have access to the library, these beautiful grounds. They're walking on that boardwalk with their dogs well, back maybe there. We could, maybe we could do more to include the neighbors and make them feel that oh, this is their college. I, 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 frankly, we keep the colleges kept up a lot better than the houses that are complaining well, about us do. You know? yeah. And as somebody that now lives very close to the university, very close to Camp Randall and the football stadium, I have to smile when I see people complaining in the State Journal about mm -hmm. Edgewood and how the students, the, the, the new playing field might get loud. Mm -hmm. the, the people that live around the university have no say about mm -hmm. what's going to happen, you know. And, and poor Edgewood is so hemmed in. And it's such a wonderful neighbor. Yeah. I don't get it. Well, how was it when we came? Um, I, I think one of the things that has changed is when we came, we knew everybody. I mean, faculty, it's staff, true. you know, I mean, the, and now it's bigger. Right. And uh, we don't know each other. Uh, in fact, I get emails, there will be a goodbye party for so-and-so who's taking a job or another opportunity, blah, blah, blah. I, I never even met them, you know. I they didn't even say hello and now they're, and that has hugely changed. But when we came, um, Things were fine for a while, but there were some very, very lean Oof. years economically yeah, man, when our course. student body went down. And this was before Jim Evan came. And Jim Evan really did a lot for the college in terms of sprucing, sprucing I it up. I remember Sister Marie so Stephen Regis said, Jimmy's a builder. Oh, well, and he did a good <laughs> job. And another thing, kind of related, when we first came, uh, the, the college was run by the sisters. There were the sisters were presidents and deans, and most of the uh, you know top administrators were sisters, and that of course is uh, no go. longer uh, the case. And I don't know if that made a difference, but it it might have. We should we should say something, Joan, about times that were really hard. Oh. You've mentioned them as being financially difficult, yeah. but they were difficult emotionally, yes, they were. socially, psychologically. Yes. There yes. were horrible hard times when right. there was fractures and right. frictions inside the... Yeah, that's true. Uh, it, it had to do with how the college was administered. Mm -hmm. Because there, were, there was a president in there that really didn't quite have a grip on... Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know who I'm talking about. Yes. And who was a sister, by the yeah. way. Um, so those were really tough times. They were, and, and we didn't know if the college was going to make it. I mean, it, it was that it was that grim. Um, and so good old Elaine Bobian, she she I remember there was a chair mm -hmm. chairperson's meeting about mm -hmm. this president who shall remain unnamed, and uh, we we had a vote of non-confidence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was Elaine's job to go to say to her, why don't you go back to your first love teaching. <laughs> She 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 suggested that she yeah. resign. I thought good for Elaine. She was she was the one that could do that kind of work. Yeah. Anyway, so th those those were difficult times in the college. They really were, and because because the the what would I say? The lack of and I think I can see it. I can say this pretty clearly. The present administration in Washington, in a way, kind of resembles what was happening here on a tiny tiny scale, and that was that there were fractures that went all the way through to the bottom because mm -hmm. they started on the top. Yeah. Yeah. And the so. weekend, the precursor of the RAD program today was the weekend degree program and very interestingly it was the weekend degree program that was supporting the rest of the college. I mean, there, when we came, that. they, were, um, they were on the ascendancy and they were the only game in town. I mean, they were the only adult program at that time before all of the others came in. And um, yeah, the, the weekday program was very, so this, very this college has survived right along by oh, making yeah. some innovations. Yeah, exactly. Like uh, going uh, co-ed. That was before our time. Right, right. Yeah. Hmm. So. Okay. <clears throat> Do you have any good Edgewood stories you like to share? Oh. Well, we've shared a couple. We've had, had, we've had a couple good ones. Yes. Anything else come to mind? Oh, uh, let me see. Let's see. Let's see. Edgewood stories. Edgewood stories. Well, there's one that Sister Jane um, made me think of this one. 
I don't know if it's still done or not, but the faculty used to be invite, invited to the mound. Yes, that's right, that's right. For a weekend. Mm -hmm. And those were the days when the, the sisterhood, the new recruits were fewer in number. And so there were rooms available. They used mm -hmm. to have a, it was an officiate, a lot sure. of rooms. Yep. And so there were rooms for us to stay in. Right. And it was, to me, it was such a hoot to see how our sister faculty <laughs> members enjoyed themselves there. Yes. They were going home. And they, they would dance together, they, they sang together, they were having so much fun they together. They drank. They drank together. They had a bar, you know. <laughs> I mean, I almost they lost did. my teeth when I saw that, but it was, you know. Oh, gee, I'm sorry. I mean, when I say drank, they, I'm not right. saying wild, wild party, but Pretty so wild. Those, were, those were really, really fun times. And I remember that Sister Jane was rooming uh, with another sister, and they were smoking. Sister Jane smoked, you know. Mm -hmm. But I can remember thing. as I walked by the room, she was sitting on the bed having a cigarette, you know, and she said, I wonder if the seculars are going to be loud again tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I love to see how many years have passed and I can still remember her. Oh, I think absolutely. she had her legs absolutely. Absolutely. I have one more story, Joan. Oh, good, because you I don't have any. And you, you reminded me of this story. later. You told the story about trying to look a little bit reserved when yes. came in for your yes. interview. Well, after Sister Jane Maurer hired me, she invited me to a party. It would be um, uh, like a fall get-together, I think it might have been, right before school started. And it was right here on uh, Woodrow. They still, the sisters still had that house, I think. So I didn't know what to expect. You know, I thought it might be kind of stiff or whatever. But when I went in there, it was mostly sisters. I don't think, I might have been the only lay person there. But there was there was a, a bar, mm -hmm. there was scotch, mm -hmm. and everybody was smoking. Yeah, and yeah. they had those little, do you remember this, when you have a little uh, can, uh, pack for your cigarettes, you have a, you might have little rhinestones oh, on I, it. Oh, absolutely. You I, put I, your, I, your I them, Marlboro yes. long right, ones right, in there. Right, you know? absolutely. So yeah. They were smoking and drinking. I thought, well, this, could, this is going to be okay. Yes. I, I think that this is going to be better than I thought. They, they were not the kind of sisters that I had remembered no, in my, no. my youth. But. You know, and they were such feminists, too. I, I mean, this, as I say, I was so they shocked. Were, they were. They are. They are. Yeah. I, it, I, it was great. I regret, when I was leaving, I regretted the fact that we were beginning to lose the sisters on mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. faculty, and, yeah. and more and more of them have passed on since then. Mm -hmm. So. Um, okay, let's bring it up to today. What are you two doing currently? Well, can I talk about how it's changed from then and Oh, sure, sure, sure. Just, just one other little thing. I was thinking about this. Um, one of the things, when, when way back then, um, you, in order to be hired here or continue teaching here or to get tenure, you had to be an excellent teacher, but any type of scholarship was optional. That's you didn't right, have to Joan. do scholarship. That's right. Now, um, and increasingly through the years, the 37 years I've been here, oh my gosh, um, scholarship, now to be hired, just to be hired, you have to be an excellent teacher and you have to be an excellent scholar. A productive scholar. And a productive, excellent scholar. And to me, intellectually, that is the one thing I think that has raised the um, status, the intellectual status of Edgewood. Um, Good, Joan. Um, you know, from then to now. And this is fairly common across all colleges like Edgewood. Another thing that's different today, it was then, but there is more engaged learning, uh, or uh, there's more emphasis, I should say, on engaged learning. I'm a lecture person myself. I love to lecture and I love hearing lectures, but not all students learn that way. Um, and another thing, there is more of an emphasis, although there was an emphasis then, but now an increasing emphasis on global education. I mean, the students studying abroad has so increased, and also uh, students going out and doing internships and service learning, those kinds of things uh, um, today were not quite as prominent back then. Here's okay. one of my, my favorite things on the whole campus that we are here right now is this library. Yes. This library to me is just such 
so wonderful. And I remember my anxiety when, when it was going to be built, mm -hmm. that we wouldn't be in the heritage room anymore, because there, was, there were windows right there. That used to be the library. I used to study oh, there. Oh, the, yeah, the library was and in now, Regina. Then this beautiful building, and yes. it's, it seems like even since it's been built, yes. there's just more here. <laughs> there's, it's, it's very similar. Well, that's Definitely. another change. I mean, I remember the, the angst and the, and the regret I felt when the card catalog disappeared, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Remember card catalogs? Yes, I thought, yes, oh my yes. gosh! And of course now, and the other thing about library and scholarship and students, how much uh, the research for students has changed. Yeah, I mean, really. you know, you get online and there are so many resources. The librarians were there. great when we were teaching composition. Boy, they would just jump in and help out a lot. So, so I'm still great. Anyway. Yeah. Wow. Okay. What are you uh, doing currently? Well, Jones is still teaching, of course. Right, I'm still I, I have been retired, and I have looked every single moment of it. I don't think I have been bored for two minutes unless mm -hmm. I'm stuck somewhere. Well, somebody's talking about something I'm not interested in. But uh, <laughs> I, one thing that I carried over from teaching into my daily life is the privilege that I had as a faculty member of introducing new courses. And toward mm -hmm. the end, while I was here, all this kind of interest I have in, in, in the natural world. Um, I let loose and I started to teach nature writing courses and environmental courses. So now I spend a lot of my time, my mental time, on those issues. For example, I spent a good part of last year reading a book that was once on the index, if anybody remembers what that I is. Remember the Books index. Forbidden by the Catholic forbidden Church. Forbidden by the Catholic Church. One of right. them was Darwin's Origin of Species. It's a great big thick book and so controversial. And when I started reading it, I'll get to my I'll I'll bring the story around to something. When I started reading it, I thought, who could be offended by this book? He never Darwin never once mentions God. He talks about original creation. Why would, uh, why would original creation have been necessary when one plant variety produced another plant variety? Would God have to intercede and make this violet a little bit different from this one? Anyway, so that reading of that book, I see now why it was banned, because it's just completely changed the way I see everything. Hmm. Everything. Hmm. It, the politics, relationships, human... Boy, I'm going to have human that. No, don't. <laughs> Because it, yeah, anyway, so when I, I what am I doing now? I am still involved in things that were interesting to me when I was still teaching. Mm -hmm. I had some serious health issues since I retired and before I retired. I used to tramp around in the woods quite a bit, um, just looking at everything. And now I'm pretty much in my garden, which is also very stimulating. Well, I am still teaching full time, and I, uh, unlike Charlotte, am absolutely positively dreading the thought of retirement. I love my job. I love my office. I love my colleagues. I, I love problem solving. I love being crazy busy, and I love sort of like Charlotte. I love having to keep learning new things. I mean, what a great job. And I'm going to miss it so, 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 so much. And I love being around, this is, now this is geezer talk. I love being around young people. I, I love looking at them. I love seeing their vitality. I love looking at them and seeing all of that promise. Not, not all the time, mind you, but there's, there's something about being around that, that, that energy that I'm just just going to miss. Well, maybe they'll take me back part time. There don't you go. Uh, I, I I'm going to miss it so much, so much. This has been. I, I usually tear up at this at this point. It's just been such an incredible job. I just you don't so have blessed. to retire. Well, you have to retire sometime. Do you? I, I guess. Maybe what about not. dying with your boots on and all that thing. <laughs> I'd, love I'd love to. I'd love to. So anyway, that's okay. what I'm doing. All right. What is your uh, vision for the Edgewood of the future? Oh, what an interesting question. I, I've never thought about that. I have neither. I, I think this is it. You know, these are the good old days. More of the um, same. More of the same, I would yeah, say. Yeah. Um, I, well, let's see. I'm hoping that um, the physical plant can somehow, ex, you know, expand. 
Um, I know there are master plans and so on, and kind of you know hoping to push out that way because we are so hemmed in with space. I, and I um, hope that um, we can manage student enrollment a little bit better um, in terms of diversity for one thing, but also finding students who, who really are totally interested <laughs> in learning. <laughs> of course, I'm sure that every college faculty wants that, but um, uh, I want us to be open, you know, and um, I don't know, I'll have to think about it a little bit more. My, my visioning isn't quite clear today. How about you, Charlotte? Charlotte? Well, you know, I've been away from it for 10 years, so there's a lot I don't know about how the college has grown. But I'll say one thing that I hope will remain the case, and, and that is that we do still have students, not to contradict you, no. Joan, but we do have, have, still have students coming who really haven't had, um, don't, don't come from families that have PhDs That's and, right. and whatever. Yeah that get awakened to things and mm -hmm. find a, the, the world is new and wonderful. No, I, I agree with that. You know, and I, I think I'd like the reputation of the college to go a little yes. more national. Absolutely, absolutely. Because I to... think we're heading that way. I think yeah. that we're, you know, yeah. I see things in the paper about Edgewood and I feel so proud, you know. Mm -hmm. I saw one thing recently that said, not so recently, but this year, that said that uh, little piece in the State Journal about how um, the college where kids leave with the less the least debt is Edgewood, oh, private college yeah. or something. I think all the faculty, retired faculty, should have one give one scholarship away mm -hmm. every That's year. That's a good idea. Yeah. You do. I used to. Oh, I yeah. used to. But I'll get back to it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Of the five core values of Edgewood College, which one speaks to you the most? Joan? Okay, I'm not a huge fan of the core values. I mean, uh -huh. I, I, I think they're wonderful and so on, but I, I worry that they become um, trivialized, you know. I can never remember what they are, as everyone Do they have can. legs, I guess. Do they you... have legs, you know, do as we say, not as we, you know, do as we say, not as we do walk the walk, talk the talk, walk the walk, and they're fine, but I always confuse them with those of the Boy Scouts, and um, you know, I get, let's see now. But I, I think that one that I probably would uh, um, embrace would be community, because through um, my time here, not as much today, but through my time here, um, Edgewood has been a caring community. Um, someone is sick and the president, you know, jumps in and visits, you know, and, and people rally around. But I think now that the idea of community has extended into, of course, the larger community. But I, I sort of miss that community that, that was back then, although growth has made it less, you know, it, it's not as possible today as it was back then. Okay. Charlie? You know, the one that I see Edgewood representing probably, at least in my eyes, the most clearly or the most earnestly, mm -hmm. is justice. Yes, that's true. Uh, the, the, the students get involved in projects that have to do with that and they're, they're interested in uh, civil rights and they're interested in environmental things and they're, mm -hmm. they're uh, so justice has always been something the sisters have been very interested right. in that's true. work for. That's true. Uh, and I think an, an, an value that matters a lot to me um, because it encompasses so much as compassion. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. That's Christian. You know, and uh, I'm not much of a Christian anymore, but as I've been saying lately, I think the world of Jesus and uh, as a prophet or however, he uh, he introduced something really radical. It's, it's, not, it's it, We say it over and again, but it's really true that it's good to be nice. Mm -hmm. It's good to be kind. It's mm -hmm. it's good to stop hitting people. Make this country kind again. To share. I mean, compassion is a very a very Christian value. It's, to me, it's a central Christian value, Catholic value, if you want. But you know, and at times, Edgewood's Catholic, you know, Catholicism has not 
always lined up with the Dominican values, and uh, there's been kind of a just disconnect, exactly. Disconnect between those two. For example, I'm talking about the hierarchical Catholic Church, which was a little sad, sad during certain times in our, um, in our, in our history or the time that I've been here. Um, so, but you mean the ways in which the uh, the campus, the college, was uh, scolded? By sometimes that, by and and also um, our um, the the Catholic position on things such as um, gay and lesbian rights and um, we couldn't really talk about them and I remember one of the sisters whom I respect totally she said well we we can't openly um, or we can't openly um, what's the word uh, approve of gay lesbian, and this is a while back, mind you, uh, the gay and lesbian uh, rights, but we've always been a welcoming place. It's sort of the don't ask, don't tell kind of thing of Clinton, you know, we couldn't really uh, espouse them. And I think that's changed. I think today we're much more open about those things. But in the past, Catholicism and the Dominican values have not always been quite in sync, in my opinion. I remember who was it? One one president said to me one time, "Well, I just try to stay. We, we just try to stay under the radar." Yeah, yeah right. We're just <laughs> okay. The chance, I guess. You know. Yes, right, right. Just yeah. stay under the radar. Yeah. I remember one time when Kate Clarenbach, one of the founders I was of now, was yes. offered a an honorary degree, and and there were people protesting. Yes. Not our, not us. Not us, not from within the college, but people. Well, the board of trustees was very reluctant to give her that that honorary degree, right. definitely. And and it happened recently. Um, one of your um, uh, the persons that you admire, the daughter of Aldo Leopold. Leopold, the faculty voted to give her an honorary degree, but it just felt you know didn't happen because. She had um, been a Why? founder of um, uh, no, uh, no, she no, wasn't a enough. clinic uh, uh, which oh, gave abortions. Gave abortions and Is that why? I thought it was because she didn't have a big donation to me. No, well, no. But but anyway, <laughs> <laughs> the board, the board. Now we're the really board. getting into it. You better, you better, you better, you this better add this job. Lastly, oh, okay. Then. Uh, what wisdom would you like to impart? Oh, oh, you mean just in general yeah. to the world? Be Come on. nice. Oh, be nice. You know, I I give this little wisdom to my students um, uh, at, toward the end of the year uh, in my lifespan class. You know, um, as we get older, um, we don't hear as well. Perhaps we don't see as well. I said, listen, this is my little sermonette to you. I try not to do this a lot, but this is my sermonette. Live, experience. Um, just read and 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 just just you know just get as much life under your belts as you can, so that when you're tied to a chair at the county home, and you can't see and you can't hear, you will have wonderful things to think about. There and you go. Uh, and Charlotte, I have, remember one time this has to do with Charlotte. One of uh, my advisees said that Charlotte had made them. Um, memorize a poem and recite it to her as part of their final exam. And my <laughs> students said that Charlotte told them that she was going to be giving them a gift, something beautiful that they could carry with them. So, anyway. Thank you, Joan. I would say, to, to just add on to what you're saying, is I would say to people to persist in something oh, that, yeah. that you really love. Mm -hmm. Find out what you really love and yep. just persist yep. in it. Even if it isn't something that you can do for a living. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I think about my, I'll end where I started, I think about my father playing that cello for mm -hmm. 50 years mm -hmm. and how much joy it brought to him yeah. and to all of us. Yeah. And he just did it. Mm -hmm. Even though he and my mother would be having a whopper of a fight, on Tuesday night <laughs> he would zip that cello into the case and get in the car and fiddle away, you know. Oh. Persist on persistent things.